Plants are all around us, and of course, probably the second oldest use after the need of using plants for food is the use of plants for shelter. So next we want to look at a lot of different ways in which plants are used in ancient societies and modern societies, and probably even future societies, as construction materials, and how the availability of plants in different kinds of environments affects the way that people build their houses and the way that people see themselves as living within an environment impacts the way that they approach those building materials and choose to use them, where they elect to position themselves within the environment. House materials that are made from both plants and other natural sources such as sand and rocks and so forth are constructed based upon two constraints. So the first constraint is the physical limitations of the materials being used. And the second is the cultural parameters and cultures put certain constraints themselves on ways that they uh, think that materials should be used or can be used. The, a, a second point about the way that plants are used within a culture is the, the relative shape, location, and symbolism of houses and the fact that this varies pretty broadly from culture to culture. And so therefore, there's not really a single way in which people in different cultures build their houses. There's not a single location where people think it's appropriate. But all of this is tied up in people's worldview, in the kinds of materials available, and in the ways that people are choosing to interact with the physical environment around them. Thirdly, house designs frequently reflect or represent cultural worldviews of uh, the roles of humans in the world. So, how people make a house can oftentimes reflect how they see themselves as relating to the world. Do they see the world as something they want to hide from, or do they see the world as something that they want to engage actively? Uh, that, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of a complex discussion. When we examine cultural relationships with nature, there are two perspectives to consider. How people see themselves, and how others see a particular community that is not their own. For the most part, ethnobotanists seek to see the world from both perspectives, but are particularly keen to understand how people see themselves. The perspective that people have their own relationships with nature involves a complex mixture of the reality of individual lives and cultural or community ideals or standards. People may hold one view as ideal, yet because of circumstances such as poverty or community expectations, live in a very different or even conflicting way. For the balance of this episode, we want to try to think about how people see themselves in an ideal situation, although the photos of houses that are shown probably more often represent compromises. The first internal perspective that we will consider of relationships with nature is one that is thought of by many as being ideal. This is a harmonious or synergistic relationship wherein humans are seen as part of the natural world. There are variations on the perspective with some involving worship of the land, environment, or living things in nature. Other perspectives simply recognize that humans are connected with nature as a single economy and therefore depend upon the environment for life support. Although people in any walk of life may feel this kind of relationship, this is the kind of interaction with nature that is commonly ascribed to the oldest forms of human culture, those of hunter-gatherers who do not depend upon domesticated plants or animals. Perspectives of harmony with nature are commonly ascribed to many cultures based upon simplistic and ignorant views of people's past, present, and future interactions with nature. This photo is the headquarters of a major corporation with many capital assets, including land with natural resources. However, this may not represent what you expect. This is the headquarters of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Native Americans are often cast as being primitive, traditional, backward, 
and living in harmony with nature. It is unclear if these terms were ever true. In some cases, these may be accurate descriptions of individuals, but are not accurate descriptions of entire cultures. In this case, the Seminole are a modern people with modern aspirations, strengths, weaknesses, hopes, and dreams. They face the same environmental issues that the rest of us do. In some cases, their decisions about how to interact with the environment are driven by traditional wisdom. But in many cases, decisions are made following modern ideas about economy, power, and science. The same could have been said of any people making decisions at any point in history. We have to be really careful that we don't over-idealize or glamorize people, particularly people from the past. However, most people around the world look to their past with perspectives uh, that their past was some form of ideal state of living. The average person looks back on more peaceful times when life was considered to be more simple. At times, they dream of living a more harmonious life with nature and even make changes in their life to get closer to this. However, at the end of the day, most people choose to live in situations that are isolated from nature to, uh, to at least some extent. A compromised situation is to attempt to cooperate with nature or to be positively competitive with nature. Uh, the environment, and particularly land, is valued for what it produces in this kind of perspective. Uh, community social and physical structures are constructed around interactions between people and the resources around them. This is a perspective that is often held by agricultural peoples who make up the majority of the Earth's human population. Communities that seek to cooperate with nature are widespread. This house is in the English community of Oxford. This is the site of the oldest extant university in the world. The same city is well known as an example of a common system wherein parts of the environment are used and managed together by the community and other parts are used and managed by individuals or smaller groups such as families. This painting is a recreation of a Native American community in the desert southwest. In this scene, life is centered on a house complex with resources featured that have been brought from the surrounding environment. The resources include domesticates such as corn and dogs, and wild resources such as deer, fish, and wood. We assume that the community depicted lived in cooperation with the environment because they persisted for hundreds of years without exhausting the resources of their environment. However, at a point in time, the environment changed, and the interaction with the environment became non-sustainable. The culture collapsed, leaving hundreds of empty communities, such as this one at Mesa Verde, Colorado. The key point here is that although a culture may develop an existence that is harmonious or cooperative with nature, it does not mean that the strategy will be successful indefinitely. A third form of interaction between a culture and nature is one that is antagonistic or dominating. People view the environment as working against them and something that must be overcome and ruled. Unmodified nature is seen as a waste of land. Economies are focused upon a few products that are heavily selected for human control and are often dependent upon people for reproduction. This view is another that is commonly held by agricultural societies, particularly where agriculture has been intensified to the point of loss of most wild places or development of extensive cities with dense populations that are isolated from nature. No culture would like to be stereotyped as a hater of the environment or one that destroys nature. In reality, all cultures have individuals who interact harshly with nature. In some cases, these individuals rise to positions of power and exercise their perspectives on vast resources. Probably many modern corporations could be listed here at the risk of defamation litigation. Fortunately, there does not seem to be a traditional culture that holds exclusively to a dominating perspective. Those who are often classified as being dominating of nature are not entirely so, as seen in this photo of a typical Japanese community. Trees, 
gardens, and other elements of nature are common in most communities, such as this town in Switzerland. However, a form of generic, globalized culture that is developing is not dependent upon local resources, but depends upon a vast network of resource extraction, wherein people are not able to be aware of the source of the foods, medicines, and construction materials that are used in their society, and therefore have little relationship with the environment that produces these supplies. Thus, globalization may be the force that pushes communities toward antagonistic or dominating relationships with nature. Housing and other kinds of shelters reflect the way that people see themselves interacting with nature. These interactions are complex mixtures of solutions to environmental problems such as bad weather, limitations on building materials, and cultural histories of traditions for successful living. We don't often consider how complex housing can be, but it is not simply protection from the environment. Housing embodies cultural perspectives of privacy, openness, faith, right, wrong, politics, economics, and thousands of other issues. There are many limiting factors about housing that may be examined that are reflections of cultural perspectives of nature. One of these is the place where a house is located. Location is a compromise between cultural understandings of what is really the best spot for a home and environmental limitations and opportunities that may be available. Location considerations include proximity to resources such as water, plants and animals that are used, and roads or waterways that link to other people and communities. Proximity to water and land for growing food is, ver is a very important consideration. In this image, a Mon family is maintaining their farm on floating rafts that are adjacent to their home that is also on a floating raft. In another image of the same community, we can see that floating houses are adjacent to a farm on land that is periodically flooded. As water levels rise and fall, the houses can be kept adjacent to the area that is being farmed as well as being adjacent to supplies of water. This village in Madagascar is located on a hill at the edge of a swamp. The swamp is where the community grows its principal crop of rice, while the hill where the homes are located is drier than the surrounding area and is defendable against enemies. This castle is located in a defendable position that allows those inside to see approaching enemies. The elevated position also serves as a powerful political symbol for those within sight of it. The houses in this community are arranged along the road with access to the road, with the road being the unifying feature of the entire community. The housing here is organized around a market next to a river. There is little space, so every bit of space is used. The materials used to make houses provide insights into the way that people interact with nature. Generally, communities who rely upon locally available construction materials are more likely to be aware of the resource base and are more likely to have developed conservation values to make sure that the materials are available when needed. Conversely, communities relying upon materials drawn from distant locations are less likely to be aware of the plants, animals, and environments that the materials are from, and therefore will not have developed ways to conserve these. The specific kind of ecosystem from which materials are collected relates to the perspectives of people about the resource. Generally, in the United States, swamps are perceived as bad places where people would not want to live, work, nor gather resources. Forests have variable perceptions, with some seen as dark and gloomy, while others are perceived as park-like and relaxing. Fields are generally seen in a very positive light, so much so that most American homes have at least a small patch of field in the form of a lawn. Resources gathered from swamps are of low concern to the average American. Resources from forests are sometimes of concern depending on the kind of forest. Old forests with large trees are considered to be precious, but young forests with small trees may be treated with abandon. 
Grasslands, on the other hand, are expected to be used and resources from grasslands are considered to be of high value with special tax support to maintain family farms, golf courses, parks, and other kinds of grasslands that are maintained for resources. The pontoon floats, walls, and many other parts of this Mon houseboat are made of bamboo. The bamboo grows in forests near the lakes and the homes where the materials are used. These forests are precious and conserved in order to maintain a steady supply of building materials. Although this is a modern city in Italy, most of the houses in it are older and made from bricks, wood, and stone from the surrounding area. The materials are for the most part sustainably extracted from the environment, and the members of the community are aware of the origin and value of the materials. This house is made to withstand cold winters. Part of it material is from forests nearby, but most are from widely distributed areas distant from the builder and the owner. The kind of, this kind of situation can easily lead to unsustainable use of natural resources since there is little to motivate the homeowner to consider the life cycle of the plants and other materials that have gone into the home. Quite often, larger traditional sacred structures are made of rare materials whose usage cannot be sus sustained or from materials drawn from a great distance. Here is a temple in Japan which is made from such rare and precious materials. Here is the front of the Vatican, which can be considered to have similar characteristics as far as the building materials go. As well as buildings, other sacred objects and structures may be constructed uh, of difficult to obtain materials. Among the most extreme examples, or pyramids in various parts of the world. In a few cases, a house may be made of no local materials, and the builders and owner may feel no connection whatsoever to the resources used in its construction. Houses are not randomly positioned. In addition to being oriented in relationship to roads, rivers, and other external objects, houses are oriented according to other environmental and cultural concerns. Many cultures hold that a house's door must face in a specific direction. Others hold that windows should be oriented in specific directions. The presence or absence of walls and other obstructions is also different across cultures, with some cultures seeing no need for walls and, other ex and others expecting the walls to be quite strong or solid. Entire houses may be oriented by compass directions or facing holy sites. Wind patterns may dictate the orientation of a house, with the wind being either a desirable or undesirable thing to have passing through the house. This Ririo village is located next to the ocean, with all of the houses oriented perpendicular to the ocean so that winds off the ocean blow through the houses and cool them. In addition, the houses are arranged so that they do not block each other's exposure to the airflow. Grouping of houses varies between cultures. Some cultures prefer to have each home located apart from all others. Other cultures group houses together into extended family compounds or villages. Houses may be grouped or dispersed for uh, in environmental, political, or social reasons. Communities with loose governments tend to also have loose community structures with individual compounds. Communities with highly structured governments tend to have tightly associated communities gathered as towns. Another complexity of grouping of houses is grouping of structures managed by a single family. In some cases, a family will have a set of buildings, each with its own function, a kitchen, sleeping house, storage building, work shed, and guest house may be located near each other as distinct buildings. In other cases, a house consists of rooms, each with its own designed function, such as a kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, living room, etc. These Thai house compounds are each surrounded by tall fences. The area within the fence is the space of one family with one or more houses within the fence used for a number of purposes. Houses may be clustered without clear boundaries between homes because boundaries do not matter 
or do not really exist. Houses may be arranged along a street or waterway with distinct boundaries and areas that are group versus individual domains. The houses seen here are all part of a compound of buildings used by one Bambatana family. Some structures are used as kitchens, some for sleeping, others for meetings. This is an upland Ririo village in the Solomon Islands. Only one house is visible, but more are within the trees behind this one. The community consists of houses, each surrounded by a palisade of trees that become quite large. The trees serve as a living fence for protection from enemies. The trees produce edible nuts that are part of the staple diet of the Ririo. Gardens are located on the slopes adjacent to the community in the forest. The specific functions of a house vary with many not used to house people, but for specific community purposes. This is a healthcare facility in Tahiti. This is a daycare center. This is a water mill used to process grains. This is a school that some of you may recognize. This castle was used as a warlord's political center of a Japanese prefecture. Some structures are very specific in their tasks, such as these boat sheds. This Palawan men's house is used for ceremonial activities as well as daily tasks of the men in the community. House construction styles vary much across the cultures of the Pacific Islands. This is even true of linguistically related cultures living in similar environments. Probably the greatest diversity of housing is found within the Solomon Islands, where over 100 cultures are scattered across thousands of very large to small islands. The next several images are examples of some of this diversity. Housing in Polynesia is far less diverse, although each cultural and island group has distinctive features. This house from Rotuma is typical of a Western Polynesian style that may be constructed with or without walls. In 1994, I conducted a survey of housing in Western Polynesia, working with Tongan, Samoan, Rotuman, Uvean, Futunan, and Fijian house builders. The work was conducted in order to better understand the relationships between the cultures and in order to identify the level of knowledge that was spread from island to island when they were colonized. This is the same house that was just shown except at the beginning of its construction. The following is a discussion of the typical parts of a typical Polynesian house and the kinds of materials used in their construction. The most important part of houses, including Polynesian houses, is the foundation. Foundations vary in their composition, with many being made of stones, sand, and coral. The primary supporting structure is next most important. In Polynesian houses, the primary supporting structure is composed of 1 to 20 posts that are firmly planted in the ground or in the foundation. Commonly, 6 to 8 posts are used for primary support. A well-built house foundation will take two to three men, one to two days to build. Larger foundations, as would be used for a chief, may take more men and substantially longer to construct. A foundation may be composed of a solid stack of rocks or of, rock wall, or of a rock wall filled in with sand, soil, and smaller rocks. Similar construction work is used to make a ceremonial platform or altar. Once a foundation is built and the primary posts are planted, the framework is constructed of lateral purlins. These are followed by vertical rafters. In many cases, both primary rafters that are thicker and secondary rafters are used. The use of both primary rafters and secondary rafters is important if the house is to withstand hurricanes or if the thatch is to be burned off after it is old and leaking. The construction of house frames is variable, with some craftsmen investing more than others, both in the value of the materials and in the time invested. 
Rafters and purlins are attached to the posts and to each other with cordage. Cordage is made from tree bark, from coconut husk fibers, from vines, and from smaller plant stems. Of course, today, many carpenters will build a house using nails in place of vines. Cordage from hibiscus inner bark fibers is quite common and easy to use. It is not, however, the best material and will deteriorate after a, a short period of time. Coconut husk fibers made into rope are much more durable and used for longer term construction. Varieties of coconuts with thick husks and smaller kernels are often selected for fibers since the fibers are longer and tougher. In areas where tall forests grow, some vines and aerial roots are used to make forms of cordage that are even better than coconut husk fibers. The vines must be pulled out of the forest canopy without damaging them. This involves a person climbing up a vine, cutting several other vines, and then climbing back down the vine. This is a small roll of cordage made from one vine that was growing more than 100 feet up in the forest canopy. Flooring in Polynesian houses may consist of woven leaf mats, sand, small stones, boards, or pieces of palm wood such as is shown in this picture. Thatch is made and applied to most Polynesian houses either as sh shingles or sheets. These are made from palm leaves or from strap-like leaves such as sugarcane or pandanus that are tied to sticks to function as split palm leaves. The following are different kinds of thatch. Thatch can be applied in several different ways. Usually, thatch is applied from the lower edge up to the top. However, in this image, a special roof cap or peak structure has been made that is being attached first. This is the roof peak structure before it was taken to the top of the house. Cordage is also used to attach the parts of these specialized structures. A common roof cap design in Western Polynesia consists of two palm leaves woven facing each other and then the middle of one leaf split to form a three-parted structure that can be attached to the roof at the peak, locking the thatch into place with pins uh, that are placed through the roof. This is a view of walls that are reasonably well thatched. The closer together the thatch shingles are placed, the better the thatch job will be and the longer it will last. The longevity of the thatch is also related to the kinds of leaves used, with some leaves being more resistant to decay than others. The best forms of thatch, such as that made from sago palms, uh, may last up to 15 years or more. Uh, poorer quality thatch, such as that from sugarcane, may last only one to two years. Some Polynesian cultures thatch their walls and others do not. These walls are thatched with the same sheets as were used for the roof, and then they have been woven together for wind resistance. Other Polynesian cultures do not make walls but use open structures with woven wall screens that are placed along sides that face the weather or all around during storms. Houses in Eastern Polynesia are generally like those of Western Polynesia, except that some different kinds of materials are used, and in the case of Hawaiian houses, grass thatch was one of the uh, alternative thatches that was applied in a different way than thatch is applied elsewhere. This reconstructed house shows small thatch poles on the walls and the roof that are the same as thatch rafters in other parts of Polynesia. This Hawaiian house has the thatch partially applied to the wall and the arrangement of small bundles of grass tied with cordage to the thatch poles can be seen. House designs of the complexity and importance of these Hawaiian temple structures were developed in each Polynesian archipelago. In this way, buildings of the most importance are unique to each culture and often to each island within each culture.
structures of lesser importance are fairly uniform in their design, construction, material constraints, and the terminology used to describe them. Therefore, a pattern of evolution of structures can be seen in each island with common types seen all over and specialized types independently developed. The simplest category of shelters in Polynesia includes day shelters, work sheds, simple cooking houses, and temporary dwelling houses that are erected for use for a few days to weeks only. None of these structures has a foundation. All can be constructed rapidly and by anyone. This kind of work shed is very common across the Pacific Islands. Within Polynesia, the terms applied to the various parts of this building are very uniform across cultures and languages. One or two men can build one of these shelters in a few hours with materials commonly found in adjacent forests. This simple shelter is being used as a store. Similar structures are often erected for short-term events such as parties, reunions, weddings, funerals, and birthdays. Although these are only intended to last for a few days to weeks, sometimes the structures will actually last for years. Simple shelters are often placed where men or women gather to do their daily tasks, talk, and pass the time. This shed in Fiji has had wooden planks added as walls, but otherwise it's a typical traditional work shed. Common houses are constructed with at least a minimal foundation in each of the Polynesian cultures. Terminology for parts of the houses is fairly uniform, but with some newly developed vocabulary in each culture. Cookhouses with foundations, sometimes of tree logs or planks, are also found in all Polynesian communities. These houses are very useful for determining relationships between communities through the study of phylogenetic linguistics. It appears likely that the colonists of the islands of Polynesia carried with them and successfully retained knowledge of this level of house construction and not of more complex structures that must have been independently developed or redeveloped in each culture. This is a design for a common house. Houses may have either rounded or square ends. Likewise, rafters may be attached flat with a gently sloping roof or curved forming a severely sloping roof. Because of investments into the foundation and posts, these houses usually require the effort of four to five men for two to three days. A community may come together and construct a house in one to two days when one is needed rapidly. These two houses on this small island are typical of common houses in western Polynesia. This is a cookhouse that has had the thatch burned off to be replaced. Inside can be seen areas for cooking, storage of fuel, and storage of supplies. The third category of Polynesian structures includes those that are used for community ceremonial, and political activities. These include large canoe sheds, guest houses, and religious and political ceremonial buildings. Canoe sheds are constructed in a number of forms. These are used as woodworking shops, places to build canoes and other wooden objects, and to maintain and store both large and small canoes out of the water and sun. Although it is likely that each island was colonized by people using large canoes, the largest canoes were probably built primarily for ceremonial purposes within each island group rather than for colonization. If large canoes were used in colonization, then they probably were returned to the original island where they could be better maintained and stored, with the colony continuing with smaller canoes and probably not constructing canoe sheds until their populations grew large enough to support larger canoes. The A-frame canoe shed, as in the Hawaiian Haleva'a, is a very common form across Polynesia. Not only is this a good form for storage of canoes, but the mechanical features of the structure allow the beams to be used as attachment points for hoists to move canoes in and out of the shed and to raise them off the ground for servicing. The chiefly structure uh, is under construction and allows us to see the fine detailed work that is involved in making a community structure. These kinds of buildings require materials that are scarcer, are stronger, and are more attractive. The labor involved is also much greater with a community structure requiring 
many weeks of work from the entire community, and particularly from specialists. Community structures such as this meeting house are often maintained in traditional forms as a matter of pride, even when other buildings, such as the houses in the background, are built with modern materials. This Fijian chief's house is made from the best materials available as a way for the community to show great respect for their chief. For the same reason, the details of the work are finer and the best craftsmen are employed in both the construction and maintenance of the building. A large public meeting house such as this one is built with care and expected to last for many generations, if not forever. Not all houses are constructed with the same expected lifespan. Generally, those of low importance are not expected to last very long, and therefore, not much effort is invested into them. Simple shelters, such as Polynesian sheds, are intended to only last for a few days, or in the extreme case, a few years. The structures are made simply, so anyone in the community can make one. The materials that are used are the most common and the cheapest. Most often, these are made by just a few individuals or maybe even just one person. These are expected to be recycled and made over and over as needed. Simple shelters have a low social cost and a low level of permanence. Common houses are constructed with the intention that they will last for many years. Such houses may be passed from generation to generation. The foundations and lower structure, in particular, are built to last for a very long time, while the superstructure and thatch are only expected to last for a few years. These buildings are moderately expensive to construct and require the manpower resources of an extended family in order for them to be completed in a short period of time. Common houses have a moderate social cost and a moderate level of permanence. Community structures are built with the perspective that they will last forever. Only the best materials available are used. In some cases, the materials may include parts that cannot be sustainably harvested. But it is understood that they will not need to be replaced, so this is a one-time cost. The foundations and lower structure are particularly solid and built to last. The superstructure is expected to be replaced, but only rarely because the highest quality materials are used and regular maintenance is applied to increase the lifespan. Community, st community structures are very expensive to build and require the resources of a larger group or community or powerful political figure. Community structures have a high social cost and a high level of permanence. With the arrival of European and other colonists to Polynesia in the 1800s, the kinds of structures being built by communities rapidly changed. Most simple shelters and common houses disappeared rapidly in places such as Hawaii, where they were replaced by European and Asian styles of housing. Likewise, larger community structures were replaced by European-style buildings such as Iolani Palace. It is informative to consider some of the perspectives about buildings in Hawaii from the perspective of a modern architect working on preservation of historical structures. <laughs>